Okay, session seven will be chaired by Gwen Robinson, the senior fellow of the Institute of Security and International Studies at Chulalongkorn University. She's also a veteran journalist who is the senior Asia editor of the Nikkei Asian Review. She will introduce each of the panelists. Um, we have uh, six panelists and we hope for a very interesting discussion um, after, after the speakers. Thank you. Um, Gwen, you have the floor. Thank you, Lipley, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're here for the final panel of this fascinating conference. As you know, this is to discuss security issues and strategic challenges in the Indo-Pacific. And I'm really hoping this session will reinforce some of the outstanding insights for those who've been watching over the past couple of days, or even today, and or fresh ideas for those who've just tuned in. Um, we've heard, obviously, we've heard a lot about security issues and geostrategic considerations, both regional and global, as well as historical perspectives over these various sessions. Our panel, as I said, will look at the sweeping theme of security issues and strategic challenges in the Indo-Pacific, which I think is a very fitting end to a conference which was overall entitled Asia's Post-Pandemic Order and Integration and focusing on ASEAN and the Indo-Pacific region at the crossroads. Um, the underlying and I think increasingly pressing issue is that as Asia gradually becomes a global center of economic gravity, so grows the significance of any conflict uh, that might arise in the Indo-Pacific region involving a major power particularly in the ASEAN region. The big question is whether it's possible at all to achieve a shared Indo-Pacific geographical understanding and whether that could contribute to security partnerships and stability in this region and how indeed regional powers can manage the strategic tensions arising across this wide and vast region. This session, as you heard, deals with maritime security but also cyber security as well as the sensitive management of water security issues in the Mekong region by the six riparian countries, and looks at some of the existing multilateral mechanisms. For example, the ASEAN Regional Forum, the haplessly named ARF, which has attempted to contribute to the maintenance of peace and security in the Asia Pacific region. More specifically, are new and urgent challenges that could quite easily affect regional equilibrium and already have, that is particularly Myanmar after the February 1st coup. And we're fortunate, I think, to have real experts here such as Min Zin and Kawi Chong Kitavon. Um, overall, just very briefly, um, I have to say I was struck by some of the themes and concerns that have emerged from these last two days of discussions. And if I had to highlight a few, I think one is the evident unease uh, amongst some of the panelists about the increasingly bipolar balance in the region and Very growing happy. interest uh, amongst many regional players in the role for alternative powers, particularly middle powers, as we heard from Tom Parks today. Um, another is the growing aversion to pressure for alignment, uh, increasing pressure from particularly China and the US. And for many, I think the failure of ASEAN uh, to carve a meaningful role in this current crisis uh, concerning Myanmar. Overall, I think the key question to pose panelists is whether the Indo-Pacific cooperation can play a bigger role in managing present and future crisis and how we would achieve that. So as this is the biggest panel of the conference with six speakers, I've asked each to keep to a maximum of 10 minutes um, and hopefully there'll be uh, time for discussion and questions at the end. Uh, so I'd first like to kick off with Jean-Pierre Cabestan, who is Chair Professor of Political Science Department of Government and International Studies at Hong Kong Baptist University, and is also Associate Researcher at the Asia Centre Paris and at the French Centre for Research on Contemporary China, Hong Kong. His main themes are going to be uh, Chinese politics and law, uh, China's foreign and security policies, its responses to the various Indo-Pacific initiatives. So over to you, Jean-Pierre. Thank you very much. Well, I'll turn off the camera because the connection is 
Yeah, connection your connection is very bad, actually. Um, yes, it's not very could... stable. So let me turn off the camera to try to keep it uh, uh, viable. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. And uh, maybe you could All speak right. up a bit, a little bit or All uh, right. closer to All the All right. I speak, I, I speak louder. And yes. uh, OK, have, uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm sorry for being out of the region. I'm in Africa doing field work there. And um, e my main point here is that instead of for other uh, venues, uh, the changing balance of power in the Asia Pacific region or the Indo-Pacific region is maybe the main driver for stability and security. So there's been a new balance of power which has been emerging in the region. And uh, and that may be the, the next years. Uh, we all know that you know what trigger uh, the changing balance of power in the region has been China's rise, which uh, first of all convinced the administration to move to um, to to launch the pivot and the rebalancing strategy, and uh, which in turn. Uh, um, um, uh, convince uh, Xi Jinping and, and the Chinese government to launch the Belt and Road Initiative, which is, has been a main uh, driver of Chinese growing influence in the region and, and beyond the region. But um, at, at the same time, the, the Chinese government has been much more um, active and aggressive in the South China Sea and, and, and uh, in the Taiwan Strait and the East China Sea. And uh, these are uh, these. This has been the main factor for the Trump administration to launch in the Pacific strategy, and, and that's that's the new context in which we are. Other players, the less important players, have also launched their own um, uh, Indo-Pacific initiative. We know there's been covered. Those will be covered by other speakers. I won't mention them, but I, I think the main drivers has been the. U.S. administration, for the Trump administration, and now the current Biden administration uh, decision to uh, keep a uh, much more, uh, uh, much more, uh, uh, much stronger um, Indo-Pacific uh, strategy. So now, in that context, what China has done vis-à-vis uh, -vis ASEAN has been to become even more active and trying to mitigate its uh, own uh, aggressiveness in the China, South China Sea with um, growing engagement um, with, with the region, not only with, through the BRI, but also developing diplomatic, cultural, and also uh, ideological uh, uh, activities in the, in the region uh, and in order to force um, closer cooperation with all the uh, ASEAN partners. But within that context, which has been more striking and which and I think China has been rather successful, I have to argue here, is uh, this, what I call in my paper, the divide and rule strategy uh, uh, developed by Beijing. A, div a divide and rule strategy which has uh, allowed China to uh, uh, reach out a number of uh, ASEAN members, uh, not only the uh, closest uh, partners of, the, of, of China, like uh, uh, Cambodia or Laos, I mentioned briefly the, the possible uh, opening of a naval base in Cambodia and close to Sien um, uh, uh, but also in other countries like Thailand and uh, Duterte's um, uh, Philippines. Now, what is interesting uh, at the same time, and that's something which uh, also sort of uh, tend to uh, demonstrate that there's a new balance of power emerging in the region, that other, uh, other members, of, uh, ASEAN members, have decided to move closer to the US. And one of the interesting developments has been the Malaysia government's um, decision to become maybe less, less, uh, less uh, discreet and, and more outspoken uh, on, on, on the South China Sea issue, uh, starting with Mahathir and, and then the, the current Prime Minister Yassin. Uh, but also, you can see also uh, the, the Singapore, uh, Lee Hsien Long's moving to the US, and um, and countries like Vietnam uh, have um, all, um, a closer relationship with the US, uh, trying to sort of balance uh, between the US and China. 
uh, on, on the South China Sea and other issues. So I think to some extent, the question is whether China has uh, you know, su succeeded in, uh, in becoming more influential in the, in the, in the ASEAN region. And uh, I, I, would, I would argue that uh, there's been a, some, some pushback from the region, but the major pushback has not come from the players in the ASEAN, but from uh, the US and the other uh, allies of, of the US or close part of the US in the region. And here I will mention the Quad, which has been the most uh, significant development. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the, the, the emergence of the Quad as a more active security, not only security forum, but also a platform for um, cooperating and coordinating uh, security matters among the major uh, players in, in the Indo-Pacific, India, Japan, and, and Australia. So um, that's uh, the, the, um, the, the, the major pushback that I have seen the region since the, since uh, in the last few years, and uh, which is not sort of putting China uh, in an unfavorable position because China has been again able, I think, to um, continue to increase its influence in, in the ASEAN uh, region. And, uh, and, and I think it's likely for that reason that it will uh, keep its uh, divided world strategy and trying to, uh, beyond the current developments, continue to develop a relationship with all the members of ASEAN, uh, including you know, bigger players like Indonesia in spite of the Natuna, issue and uh, and uh, uh, Vietnam and in spite of the recent coup we can see a lot of actually continuity in China's relationship with, with the Myanmar uh, and the Myanmar military uh, in particular since the uh, recent uh, coup in that country so in order to conclude I would say that um, the um, China is uh, pushing in the South China Sea. Uh, also, we know the part of East Asia, like the um, Taiwan Strait and the, and the East China Sea uh, we, uh, around the same factor, but at the same time has developed such an active diplomacy and co economic cooperation with, this, with ASEAN that it can mitigate those tensions and, uh, uh, and, uh, and continue to negotiate with the other claimants of the South China Sea um, more meaningful code of conduct for the South China Sea, which is maybe not going to for the end of the year, in spite of the China's um, expectation, which will, which is a, a process which allows uh, all the players in South China Sea continue to sort of uh, uh, um, uh, manage and reduce the tension in that part of the world, in spite of the U.S. Uh, pushback and. Uh, the well-known uh, freedom of navigation operation conducted by the U.S. and U.S. allies in that part of the world. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Pierre. Some interesting themes there that we uh, hopefully can return to. Um, obviously, the rise of China and its role in driving some of the regional dynamics is absolutely critical to what we are discussing now. So too is uh, maritime security uh, 